start diving in. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, all the great things that Maggot or Maggit can do. Um, so one, first of all, who am I? I'm Jonathan Chu. Um, I've been using Emacs for a little over 15 years, I would say. Uh, definitely more committed over the past, uh, I guess, seven, eight years for it. Um, I love all things Emacs, I love all things Git. So this was just a perfect fit for me when this piece of uh, software came out. Um, I've always been the de facto Git expert wherever I go. And I think it's just because of one of my previous roles, I had to be a Git expert. We did some parsing on Git repos for uh, data analysis. And as a result of that, um, I became very, very accustomed to you know learning the internals of Git you know, and using some of the plumbing tools. Uh, but I do have some confessions. Um, I don't remember any more Git commands. Um, and also this last confession really is just more of a confession, but not really related to Git, but I had to really stop myself from tinkering with my Emacs config when I was working on this talk for all the things I could have plugged in. Um, but this is really all good stuff because of Maggie. I mean, it has transformed the way that um, I started thinking about Git and how I use Git. And just to take a quick step back, so what is my Git? And uh, you'll see it says it's a Git porcelain in Emacs. Um, so if you're familiar with this analogy to that, you know we have this thing called plumbing and porcelain in Git. And what the plumbing is is all the under uh, the all the workings underneath that equal the nice pristine thing that we work with, which is the end command. So a porcelain command would be a Git checkout and a Git branch. And a plumbing command would be a commit work tree or um, a red parse kind of command. So what Maggot does is that it wraps Git commands combined with its uh, unique workflow, which is pop-ups and arguments you can uh, pass in to really make it easy to understand. And I will venture to say it really does have enough functionality to forever free you from ever having to use Git on the command line. So if when you do start a new Maggit repo, um, the first thing it does say is in the beginning there was darkness and I actually found this really uh, funny XKCD. So I had to just throw it up there and I'll give you a second to read it. So I think we've all been in this situation before too. You know, So some of the things that I think with the learning curve of Maggit and also, you know, with the underlying tool itself to get is that sometimes it can be daunting learning a lot of these tools. So we're going to start diving into the main core features of Maggit and basically it can be broken down into two separate areas. You know, you're going to be doing some inspecting of your files or some editing, you know, uh, pushing, things like that. So let's start diving in. Where you live, the first thing you go to is the Maggit status buffer. Um, you can access it by you know, just hitting meta X, make it status, or what they say to do is map it to um, control X, G. And let's just hop into this repo since I'm here right now. So I just hit, let me uh, turn on command log mode. Was it? I messed up my binding. <laughs> Sorry, folks out there to see. Oh, <laughs> uh, all right. So this way you can see all my keys I'm pressing here. So if we want to hop back to the presentation. Um, when you first get into the status buffer, uh, there's a number of different sections that you're going to see here. So. It really depends on what's the status of your current repo right now. So I have an untracked file, which is this first section here. Um, you have unstaged changes. If I had any stage changes, you would see them below. Uh, and also recent commits. You can have multiple different modules in here, depending on what kind of plugins you have too, um, whether that's pull requests and also. Um, from this, if you do some work, you can always hit G to refresh the buffer or capital G refreshes all the get buffers that you have out there. Um, it's just sometimes handy if you ever kind of have to pop out into shell and do some kind of get command and this doesn't reflect the change, you can always hit G and it'll just update it here. So another great thing to have um, is to set up a global get file mode. Um, 
I've started really only using that recently, and it's just really handy when you just kind of want to jump into um, doing something in Git without having to kind of leave your files context space and having to get into the status buffer. Um, and also, we get dispatch as well. And if at any time you do get lost, uh, you could always hit the question mark. And it'll bring up all the commands that you can do here. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the sections. Uh, so for movements, it's pretty much like the same Emacs stuff that we know. Uh, NP goes up and down. Also meta NP jump from section to section. Um, visibility can be toggled uh, if you hit tab on some of these files. And you know, let's go into this. And let's just stage something so we can see some changes. Or not. There we go. So if you go from meta n, you can kind of hop down between these two um, diff changes here in this file. Oops. You guys still see my screen. All right. And all right. So moving on, uh, diffing. So there's lots of stuff we can do with this first uh, status buffer here. So we can take a look at the uh, example I just had up there with uh, diff, diff options. So by hitting capital D, we're going to see a bunch of options we have here. Um, and it's, it's really handy for some of these things. So the things I use mostly here are context lines, which is a dash U, and also uh, the toggle below for hunk refinement. So these are some of the really uh, cool features that I found. So if you want to change something like uh, the hunk refinement. So what that is, is that it's going to toggle it on and we can see uh, actual word changes. Uh, I may just toggle it off. So since these are new lines of text, you know, this is not a good, let's do some live editing here and just do this. So now we have unstaged changes here. And there we go. So when you toggle that hunk refinement, you can see that XXX is now highlighted there too. So it's just really handy when you have those word uh, diffs that you need to do, especially on long lines. Um, this is really analogous to a git diff uh, dash dash word diff, which I missed until I found out that this existed in the git as well. So going back to this. Oh, and also there is a, um, you can see the, history of a function that has changed. Um, and this is super handy if you're in a diff and you wanna say, tell me how many times this function changed over the course of you know history here. Um, I know it's not gonna work with Lisp here, but it will work with most other uh, functions like a Python function or a Ruby function or something like that. So um, it's just gonna return nothing here, but it will be control C, control T to bring up that history. And just doing something like this in the git command line is just gonna be much more cumbersome than just doing it right here in a Git. So moving on for logging, there's a ton of logging options. I literally just put L here because that's that's uh, the start of this gateway in here. So let's just hit L and take a look at what we have. I have uh, show graphs as an option on already. Let me bring this back up here. Um, but it's not too interesting since this is my uh, .emacs repo and I'm the only one really working in it. Um, but it's really handy to see the branches and twigs from the history, uh, especially if you're working on a branch. Um, a ton of different options. Please do read the manual for these things. Uh, they're just, it's much easier to kind of piece these together in my opinion than it would be to have a Git alias where you have something you like for a Git log and then constantly uh, building off that to get what you need here too. Um, another great thing that we can do here is that you can hit capital L to toggle some of the uh, visibility uh, options we have here. So if you see on the right side, you see the author's name and the time committed. Um, I like to have absolute dates because I find that it's just more useful, especially when you actually need to look at a past commit or a bug in the past that you have an absolute date. Um, but I think by default, it might be, uh, I just toggled it off. Let's just do it again. 
oh, I hard coded this in there. Um, it, it does relative dates as well. So if we go into the uh, get status and we could do the same thing here and toggle this visibility. I'm sorry, toggle style, there we go. I was hitting capital L. So you can see it does relative dates here as well too. So these are super useful when you kind of just want to take a pulse and like a high level picture of like what's going on. But I find that the absolute um, dates here are just more useful to have. So this is also a configuration setting that you can have and put that in your the get config or you can just toggle it here, which is uh, just, just as easy. All right. So blaming, same thing here. We can do everything uh, the same as git blame in the git. And let's just go into this file. And again, this is not gonna be too interesting for you all because it's all me. And let's just blame and everything. So um, yeah, so you can see exactly when everything was committed. Um, I know you can drill into these two, but I don't wanna make this super slow right now because it did freeze up on me before, so I'm not gonna click into it, but you can further go on into um, finding out the blame and blame and just keep going down that path, which is really, really useful when you really do wanna blame someone. Um, let me, I didn't know it actually has that not committed stuff. Well, let's quit out of this. Um, and at any time, uh, you can always bury these buffers by just hitting Q too. All right, for staging. All right, so let's do some work. We actually just started doing some of this too. So you can stage, unstage, and these are all the same kind of commands that we're used to on the Git command line. So for this hunk here, we can stage and unstage with U and S, and we can just do it just on this uh, hunk itself. What Maggot really is awesome, or where it really is powerful, is that you can be really selective about what you choose here. So I can choose just to stage these lines here. You know, um, this would make a really odd uh, diff because I need to do the deletion as well, but you can really get granular and just do uh, one line if you need to. Um, anytime it would reject you, you would see a message on the bottom of the buffer and you can always hit dollar sign to kind of see what's happening. Um, this is one of the uh, Magit process buffers and just see what's happening with your Git command because essentially Magit is just shelling out to Git and just running these commands. So you can see exactly why it would be rejected on a Git level. Um, so we can stage us. Uh, we can also uh, toggle the uh, change the visibility, um, the number of lines of visibility for these. So if I hit minus on these, I can start kind of breaking out these hunks. So this was only one uh, change here. So we're not going to get too anything too interesting. But let's just stage this whole thing by hitting S. So now we have a whole bunch of changes here, staged and ready to go. And let's see, and finally getting to what we do every day for the most part, uh, committing. So we go back here um, to commit, we go over the stage stuff and we can just hit C and it brings up the commit pop-up. Um, there's a ton of different options here. Allow empty commits, really nice to remember. I always forget how to, what the actual um, arguments are in there. And it's really nice to have just a dash E that we just type in for that. Um, you can toggle any of these on and off and ultimately you can just hit c to commit so just real quick we can go through the rest of these extending uh would just extend the commit without changing the commit message previously it's just like amend um rewording lets you go in there and just actually fix up the commit and change the uh, wording uh amending is the amending that we know of. there's fix up squash um, you can do instant fix up and instant squash where it basically just uh, rebases on top of that fix up or squash there too. So there's a lot of different options here. Um, so when we're ready to commit, we hit C and we're getting into, uh, I just hit, uh, this was a great feature I found and I actually found it out by watching a video on Megit recently. Um, if you hit meta N and meta P, you can toggle through uh, past history of commit messages. I had no idea. And it's so useful now to know that whatever I wrote isn't gonna be lost forever. Uh, but let's see, so stage, uh, adding some more awesome stuff. And once you're ready with that commit message, we would just send this off by hitting uh, control C, control C. 
And there you go. So now we have a new section here, which is the unpushed changes um, to my branch and uh, also unpulled because I also did pull uh, something, uh, um, push something before here. Let's just make all this visible. All right. Oh, and something I forgot. Um, there's something uh, you can do here, which is really easy actually, which is using Git headers when you're committing. Um, let's go back to that. And let's say we want to amend it. Just get into it real quick. So I just hit uh, Control C, uh, Control A to just do a commit amend. And I believe there's some tags here, uh, headers here. So C, T would do tested. Um, this is all in the docs, by the way. I think there's uh, seven or eight different options here that we can do. So suggested. But it's uh, super handy if you actually do use this kind of conventions here and you can just uh, have one command to you know tag it in. So let's actually do that. And now our, our commit message, we hit enter on it, should have the testify tag on it. So right there. All right, um, going through branching, uh, you know, there's not too much we can say about this. I think we're all pretty much familiar with it, but let's hit B to bring up the branch pop-up. Um, you know, we can create a new branch um, and create a new branch and also check it out, create a new branch and not check it out. Um, one of my favorite features here, as you just saw, was a spin-off. Um, I do this all the time where I'm working on a branch and I don't realize I'm on master and I make a few commits and basically it's like, oops, I should not be pushing this to master. I should be branching. So this made it a ton easy to actually do that where you can hit B and S and that'll spin off a new branch. And you know you can name this branch like you know, awesome branch name. And what this does is that let's say you make, um, you know, one or two commits on master, but you don't push it yet. And if you do a spin off, this makes a new branch of your current work resets the head back to the origin of where it was before and basically kind of just puts you on that new branch with your work with those commits replayed on top and setting the uh re resetting the head of the other master branch that you were on so this really just makes a workflow um choice here for you but it's a smart one and reasonable in my opinion and i use this all the time so now i actually don't even worry what branch i'm on um, because you can choose a sp spin off of any branch here too. All right, reverting. I think we've all done this, or it had to have done this before too. Um, you know, there's really just two options that I've used mostly, to, and you know, which is uh, V capital V capital V and capital V lowercase V. Um, and what this would do is just create a uh, when you revert, it would create a uh, revert commit, and the other time it does not. So I think that's pretty self-explanatory and straightforward. Um, resetting, there's a few different options here, um, but you can choose to reset back to, uh, if I hit X and I can just do head here, or what I like to do is I like to bring up the um, log and actually know which commit that I'm on and then hit reset on this too. So this has definitely saved my life a few times where it's just easy to kind of go back into it and just pop off those commits. Um, the different options we have here. Oh, I lost this. Um, is that it allows you to pop off, uh, to reset and also just throw those commits back into the working tree. Um, there's, there's different options so we can see everything um, from here. Uh, that would be the soft hard and you know only throw it back onto the index or work tree. All right, stashing. Uh, another great thing about Magit is that when I first started using it, I love the fact that it just brings out these things that you wouldn't normally check or know how to check too often. But I had a repo that I opened it up. I opened the uh, status buffer up and I had something like 30 stashes on it. And it was, it just made me cringe because I had no idea what work was that or why I didn't pop those off. Um, but it's a really useful thing to at least have stashes here. Um, so if we want to go back and edit a file 
and let's say message stash me. So now we have it on stage changed. I'm just gonna hit Z and Z, and this is really um, stash me is the message. Um, this is really the one that I use the most here because this will stash onto the index and working tree and also all the untracked files as well. So it's just really useful to kind of have that uh, ability and to access this. Let's say four, um, if you hit A on this stash itself, it would apply back on and pop it off. So um, this is just a really much, uh, nice, nice easier flow to use stashing here, in my opinion. So, and here it is back in our unstaged changes. All right, okay. So we're gonna get to the real meat of this too. I think it's probably what a lot of people do wanna talk about is rebasing. Um, I'm a big fan of rebase and I think it only has made me even a bigger fan because of how the Git approaches this. Um, you know, so basically you wanna resolve conflicts and rewrite history in some way. And you can do this from multiple different screens here. So let's say we wanna rebase some work here and you know, we're gonna to have to stash this again. So I should put no message in. And what I like to do is I like to go into the log because you can do it from the status buffer and hit those recent commits. But I usually in some cases, I have some body of work that I've been doing and I wanna pick a commit where I wanna start. So to start the rebase interact, if you hit R rebase and it brings up the pop-up and I wanna select I to do it interactively. So let's say I wanna start at this commit here, C71409C and do it interactive. Rebase, yeah, because we're gonna quit out of it anyway. So um, it's just complaining that I didn't push the latest work. So, um, and you'll get the screen that you've seen before if you have done a rebase. And you know, Git does nothing different here with this; it just displays it. But it makes it really easy here to, you know, uh, if you want to squash a commit here, or if you want to delete this commit here with uh, K, um, you want to move it up with meta n meta p. Let's say I want to move this commit up and rearrange history. Um, you could do anything from here and it's it's really just so handy and great to use. Um, when you're ready, you can use uh, control C, control C to tell Git to make it happen. And that's when the rebase interactive process kicks off. And I'll take you through the process and it'll show up if you have any conflicts that would pop up and stop you in that process. Um, whereas then you have to resolve it you know, or you'd have to you know skip it or and then hit continue to go forward. But for this purpose now, we're not gonna do this rebase and we're gonna hit control C, control K to quit out of it. And it's gonna ask you, you wanna abort this rebase? Yes, I do. And you're out. So another big feature I wanna talk about is with bisecting. Um, this is really, really useful if you wanna find out if you do have a bug and where the bug came in. Um, it, 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 does it does need some, um, I guess, good get practices with the branch you're gonna be doing this on. Um, I found you know, when when your team may squash commits or squash pull, pull requests in there, it, it makes it very hard to kind of uh, do a bisect because you get a huge commit um, blob instead of you know the, the linear history that you would see. But um, it does make it a lot easier in Git to actually use it and use this process well. So if we wanna just try this out, and let's say we'll go through history. Now bear with me because I always switch these up the wrong way. So to start a bisect, we would hit capital B. And right now I'm on just, I'll pick up some random commit here. And now the capital B again to start the bisect process. So it's saying this is the bad re revision. You know, let's say it is head actually because that would make more sense. We just pulled in changes and head is bad. And the good one is, let's say this commit here that I'm currently on. So you can see that it's running bisect. And what this is, um, for those who aren't really too familiar with it, is that bisect is a binary search through the um, commits here to kind of find out where, um, where that bad commit is. And as you walk through this process, it goes through uh, a, binary state of good or bad for you to answer. Um, and it basically just keeps halving the commits down until it finds the offending commit that you're after. So right now you can see that our little um, at sign here is at this commit uh, on 1D5B. 
and it's asking me, is this good or bad? So this is where you would do your checks. You know, you would see, is this code still working like I expect to? You either bring up a web browser or you run some tests. Um, and when you're ready and you say, okay, this one is good or bad, let's hit capital B and let's say this one's still good. So, okay, we just told that that commit was good. Now it's it's doing another binary search through the rest of the commits here. And it's gonna keep doing this. Um, so since we didn't pick too many, we're pretty much gonna get to the end here, which is great. So, and let's say that this one is still good, capital B and G. And let's do one more, capital B. And let's say this one is bad. So now git bisect is done. We found our bad commit. It's labeled bad right here. Um, and it's just really such a powerful uh, feature if you do know how to use it and um, have a repo that actually practices good uh, git hygiene, I guess you'd say, um, for how commits get into there. Um, if, if people do break the build and, you know, like it's, it makes it hard to, you know, um, if they break the build and then push it to that branch or master, it's, it's hard to kind of use bisect in that sense because you have to have some more knowledge and context in your head about should this really be a good or bad commit here. But again, a really, really super powerful feature that makes it easier to use in the Git. So, uh, I must have lost that place or the wrong one, sorry. <laughs> Where'd this one go? Sorry, folks, I think I must have been working in an index file because it just reverted a bunch of my stuff, unfortunately. Um, but yeah. All right. Let me go back to this. Oh, I'm still in the bisect. That's why. Oh, okay. All right. Let's. That was a great lesson here. Um, I'm still in the bisect. I didn't even realize that. Um, so, what I'm going to do right now is you can hit. Uh, Let's just hit reset and we can just quit out of this. So you're back here. Okay. <laughs> I had a heart attack with how my presentation was. There we go. So that was work that I did a few days ago on when I was writing this talk and you can see there was um, notes still to be filled in there too. So awesome, demo guides. Okay, let's get back to the present view. And yeah, and there's a lot more. Um, I wanna make sure I leave some time at the end here. I think I'm doing okay though. But um, there's tagging, there's notes. We're not gonna really get into this um, just because it's really depends on your workflow and it's pretty straightforward as to the paradigm that we've seen that you know there's a uh, Magit pop-up that will come up and have all the other options there too. So you don't need to remember all of these. You can just kind of hit that pop-up and kind of go into the tagging and the notes. Um, I've never used notes. I just literally looked it up the other day when I saw that it was a thing. Um, but I'm interested to hear if people do use it and how they use it. Um, Submodules and work trees. I don't use either of these too much. I'm only starting to realize the power of using work trees here. And I think Magit actually has a really good workflow for doing that. And um, you know, it's definitely something I want to look into more. And finally, I think just some of the um, closing things I want to leave you all with is that, you know, why I love Magit and why I think it's such a great piece of software is that it's really helped me conceptually just understand so many Git paradigms and, and, and commands that I just wouldn't have used before. It's, it, these are just, some of the commands are really not uh, too intuitive to use as well. And then as you do use some of these commands, you're just building on options and tagging on options to use it. Um, and Magit lets you kind of build that, you know, and, and, and also save that kind of um, configuration that you would like there. Um, so it just really enables me to do a lot better work and also will really lets me get this work done and then get out of it and get back to coding. And that's what I really love about it. So, the resources, there's a ton of Magit resources out there. There's folks making great videos on, on YouTube that I've been seeing. 
Um, the main one that I use constantly is the manual. The manual is amazing. Um, so please do refer to this if there's anything here that um, interests you and, and didn't get into that detail that you wanted. Uh, the manual likely or has it all in there. Um, and yeah, that's all I got here. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And I can have some questions. Um, I think I have some right now. Wonderful. Many thanks for your talk, Jonathan. And yes, I think we have some audience questions, which Greg will be helping with. Yes, he is. Okay. So let me read the question, um, the one I'm going to answer first. So the first question I see is, is it possible to stage regions in Magit when you do not use active regions? Um, when you do not use active regions, I, I'm not too clear on the active regions part, um, but it sounds like you should be able to uh, stage all in there too, just not what you're selecting. Um, I think just the level of granularity that Magit offers would allow you to do this and not just have to use active regions. You can also um, change the uh, the level or, or kind of split up those hunks that if you have two pieces of, te of, of text that are pretty close together or of code that are too close uh, together, you can keep hitting minus and minus until Git changes and kind of splits those two up into two different hunks. I hope I answered that. And if I didn't, please do message me. Um, I'll, I want to make sure I understood that question correctly. Um, what Emacs theme are you using? Uh, that actually is really important because I work on it a lot. I believe this is a slightly modified version of uh, Doom uh, Doom Emacs themes. I think it's the the one light one, I believe. Um, my config is uh, at GitHub at my name, Jonathan Chu slash dot Emacs. If you do want to check it out, everything should be updated there. Uh, three, can you add a text file describing some of the key bindings you've used in this talk? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, halfway through, I realized that the command log just kept dying, so I didn't know how to bring that back up quickly. Um, definitely this file, this entire org mode presentation, uh, let me quit out of this. If you can still see my screen here, this entire uh, org mode presentation is in, um, GitHub right now, I can definitely share this and make it more available and make it more clear about this is the, the Mag deep dive talk. Um, so yes, absolutely. Uh, what presentation mode is being used here? I think it's just org present. Um, yeah, it's just org present. And I think it just, it's a very simple thing that just goes through the top level um, org bolts there. So uh, I tried other ones, I think, when I installed this last week or whatever, it just works. So I just stuck with it. Um, it. It just seems to work really well. And to get out of it, you just hit Control uh, C con uh, and Control Q and just pops you back in here. And what do you mean by good Git hygiene? <laughs> okay, let me answer that first. I think there's, uh, is that one whole question or no, is that? These are two more. Oh, okay, okay. What do you mean by good Git hygiene? Um, yeah, I think what I meant by good, good git hygiene is um you know so like for the example that if someone when you're doing a bisect and let's say you know that your company does squash all uh pull requests that go into master it does make it really hard to do a bisect and in that case you probably wouldn't be doing it um so what i really meant by good Git hygiene before it was like you know when someone does break the build or you know we don't really care about what goes into like the master branch let's say so we can't trust those states, um, that final state and master to be good or bad at any time. So we, so what I meant by that is that we kind of have to have this more um, context aware knowledge of like, okay, I think someone broke the build and they knew it, but this one should have been good. But, you know, so those are the, those are the situations that I meant is by having good get hygiene there. Um, good question though. Can you stash only one alteration file and leave the others yes absolutely um that that's the power of that Magit status screen there is that you can go through each of those sections and just you know choose whichever part you want to stash here um so oh i already stashed here too so i can pop this off uh so Essentially, two stashes are just commit objects, or, or just commit blobs, um, similar blobs of, of Git objects. 
So you can really treat that the same there too. And also you, know, you can create stashes from it as well. But um, yes, you can definitely, definitely just uh, stash only parts of it. Um, there's lots of different options when you do that. And I just want to bring it up here. This isn't too helpful because I have only um, one line here, but uh, yes, you absolutely can. And the last question, what was the function for control C meta G in the first content slide? First content slide, let me take a look here. Um, I believe that's the dispatch or the global. Um, yeah, this one, let me get on this slide here. It was control C or control X? Control C meta G. Um, yes, this is the uh, global the get file mode. So if we go into, let's just get into a file. I have time here and control C, meta G. Um, this will bring you into this, uh, this global mode where I don't have to go into the get status here. And I can actually do all these commands that you see right now in this buffer. Um, it's just really useful if you know you just need to you just want to stage everything in here and just keep moving and you can commit as well um what is also really useful actually it's not from this one if you want to do cx meta g um you can also just do a pull you know like so let's say you're working in a file and then you realize you need to pull from master again or, or pull from the remote that you're on because someone just pushed some work to it um so and then you would hit capital f here um it's just really useful to not have to jump to that extra stage, but, um, and you could do it immediately in your file and then just get back to work after that. So last question, any advice, any advice recommendations around resolving rebase conflicts within Emacs? Uh, yeah, let me think about, yeah, it, it's, it's really dependent on, on your situation in code. Um, I think, you know, understanding what rebase does, um, in the first place is the first step because um, it's gonna be really specific to the situation that you're going through. And I could see things getting very hairy with, um, you know, you wanna rebase your your branch. You've done a lot of work and you touched a lot of different files and and people are merging in code from other files. Um, you know, so it's really hard to see what that um, kind of is gonna be when you do that rebase because it's gonna cause a conflict later on when there's an area that you may have both touched but Git may or may not have used uh, or, or, or done a good job kind of resolving that. But um, one thing I think that'll be kind of useful to see is that I've been looking at um, and, and using more for, oh, that's the Y branch, um, this idea of cherries and um, what cherries is, and actually, we actually didn't talk about this because I knew that it would be way too much. There's too much in my kit to talk about. What cherries is, is that it's not um, necessarily a cherry pick, but this will let you specify what your cherry head is. So here I can just say that my cherry head is this branch EmacsConf 2019. And you can compare the upstream against any branch here or any remote, you know, so for our purposes, we can just do master. And this tells you exactly which commits are in, uh, are really representation of your body of work right now. So the pluses represent something that is gonna be added into uh, to the remote that you chose later on. And the minuses mean that it's already there. So this is really handy that if you do see, you know, someone has made some conflicts or changes or even added one of your commits in there um, into their branch and then you can kind of resolve that. But I, I hope that answers your, your question. Um, oh wait, I got a, I'm, I got a clarification. Can I stage a region without activating transient mark mode? Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the difference would necessarily be there. Yeah, that's the question about regions. Okay. Oh, okay. Gotcha. That was for the other question. Yeah, yeah. I think they answered it there. So. Okay. All right. I hope I answered it. I think I'm um, good on time. Yeah, we should probably. Okay. Um, thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Jonathan, for the awesome talk. And also, Greg, for uh, relating the questions. Uh, 